and I'm in this profession for almost 22 years. And I'll be teaching the like uh, till days. I'll be teaching the primary. I'm dealing with the primary kids. Primary kids. That's it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Bhuvan sir. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's me, Bhuvan Vandari from Dankuta, Nepal. So I'm a secondary level teacher. I am teaching for four years. So I am participating here to. Uh, make my class very uh, attractive, not boring like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Marco, Mar Marco Marines. Uh, Marco Mari. Okay. Let's go. Oh, she's Suda. on mute, I think. Okay, she's mute. Well, I think she's yeah, yeah. Uh, Suda, Suda ma'am. Yesterday we heard you, but we didn't hear the introduction. Yeah. Jai Shri Ram. Namaste. Yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry, I joined a little late. Uh, uh, what am I supposed to do? Uh, just a bit of introduction. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir, uh, we, we missed it. Yes, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, yeah, my name is Sudha Prasad and uh, I'm basically a math teacher in Arundhati Gurukulam, based in Bangalore. So I'm into this uh, teaching uh, profession, I think, from past uh, four or five years. But before that, uh, basically, I'm an engineer. So I've done my engineering from MS Ramaya. So I've, I have worked for some uh, corporate uh, companies as well. Uh, so uh, somehow I uh, like the teaching profession. And uh, so I'm continuing with uh, it, actually. Thank Basically. you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mankumari, ma'am. Uh, hello, everyone. Namaste. I'm Mankumari Sunar, uh, joining from um, Surkhet, and I'm a teacher at Kopila Valley School. Uh, I teach science in uh, Kopila Valley School and plus population also. Okay. Uh, it's a great honor. Like, it's, um, I'm very happy to join, and today is my first day here. Yeah. So uh, sorry about it, uh, because uh, Naim sir, your principal is my very good friend. We have worked together before. So when we were chatting this afternoon, then yeah, we decided to have Yeah, I think we have met in June yes. before in, yes, yes. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the ESD Alliance. Uh, yeah. ESF good Alliance. to see yeah. you, sir. Thank you. So uh, now we have uh, Vijay Ji. Uh, Vijay, the other Vijay only there's, uh, the name is just Vijay. Just Vijay, okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, so I just, uh, I'm, I'm actually a friend of Shrikra. We both uh, studied our uh, EU uh, together. And uh, it's been over 16, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I've, uh, I'm, I've actually worked in the software industry for about 16 years. And uh, I'm, uh, I, I've been uh, all through this time, I've been a, uh, uh, volunteer, you know, on and off, I've been volunteer uh, with uh, uh, two institutes called Prerna and uh, Society Care for Indigent. So I used to go there and uh, teach children whatever they wanted, uh, you know, whatever they had interest in. So that's how, you know, I'm, um, uh, I'm very passionate about just uh, being with kids and teaching and learning myself, you know, through them. So uh, I've been doing this not as a, you know, uh, formal teacher, but uh, 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 teaching is uh, is my passion. So, uh, Shrikra and uh, Purnima ma'am just told me about this session, so I'm just attending it. So Thank you. Thank you so much. So welcome. Now we have somebody called Yatwar. Yatwar. Uh, can we have your introduction, sir? So our uh, audio is not connected. It is Divya. Divya. Uh, oh. Divya, ma'am, can you... Uh, if your audio is not connected, you can uh, leave a message on the chat and interview. Mm, yeah, yeah. So, mm, the other people, and, uh, yeah, a few people are yet to join, but still, I think uh, we can. Uh, yeah, uh, one more person to introduce. Okay, Shubha, okay. Can you introduce yourself? Who is that? Oh, Subha, 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 yes. Jai Shri Ram, uh, Jai I'm Shri Ram. Shubha Shrina. Uh, right now, I'm working in Arundhati Gurukulam as a Shikshika. 
um, earlier, like I had this passion for teaching. Uh, I am basically a homemaker. Uh, but we, since we stayed in a society, there were a whole lot of kids where we used to organize various events. So I used to take part in that where I used to train children for storytelling and uh, singing and uh, many more. Like even academics also I used to like. Uh, so the, maybe that, that was the ignition point for me. So I'm just continuing this as a passion. So I, feel, I personally feel it is more of learning than teaching. So uh, that makes me happy really. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, only a good learner can become a good teacher, and I'm very happy. In fact, our team is very happy to find um, engineer turned teachers <laughs> mostly. So we're very happy to have you in the team uh, in the field of teaching. Uh, we need really uh, we, the world needs teachers, very good teachers, professional teachers, because what happens tomorrow uh, entirely depends on what we do today in the classroom. So uh, children are young, and we have to really catch, catch them young. Uh, when the adults, as we got to know yesterday uh, from Purnima Ma'am's um, uh, you know, presentation on how brain works, you know, uh, when when we try to catch adults, it's very difficult to change. But when we try to uh, do something with the children, it's, it's for lifelong. So that's why teacher's job is really, really uh, important. Uh, that's what I feel and that's what I want everyone to feel. So Prenta Ma'am is here. Mm, uh, so can, 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 yesterday we uh, 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 forgot to do the introduction part because we had planned it but somehow we missed it. So Prenta Ma'am can you just give a very short introduction? Um, good afternoon to all present here. I'm Pranita Giri and uh, I'm from Monkey International School. I'm in the language faculty. And uh, actually, uh, we are from Nepal. So, Monkey International School is in Nepal. Uh, my school, uh, Monkey International School, is a residential school. So, um, um, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Printer Man. Uh, I hope uh, uh, the other teacher, I forgot his name, will also join. Arjun, sir. Arjun, sir. Arjun. And uh, fortunately, I have uh, teachers here from from Kopila Valley School, Mankumari and Pranita Ji and Arjun sir. Uh, your principals and I work together at Shubhatara uh, together as a vice principal. So we are very good friends. Chandran sir is a very good friend of mine. We are uh, we we are, we uh, even have the same uh, place of origin. We are from Japa, uh, very close. So when we are chatting, then just came up. Uh, okay, let why not? Uh, have some teachers in the session and we actually wanted to have a very small group uh, so that we can do more of intera interaction not kind of a big training so many hundreds of people like that but uh, very few people uh, can uh, have more introduction better introduction and so are we done with uh, whoever is here so can i now start uh, with the presentation uh, uh, except uh, yatwa uh, who is not able to Oh, somebody is uh, connecting. Uh, let's uh, get the introduction quickly. Baleriji, Pandurang Baleriji. Can we have an introduction, please? Uh, I think they're on mute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Vidya, uh, you're on mute, I think. That actually, I mean. Yeah. Okay. okay, we can continue. Okay, we'll, okay. Yeah. Uh, let me. Yeah, she's my sister, actually. So. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, she's my so she she's a teacher. She's a teacher. Yeah, she's she's okay. actually she's a formal teacher. She has been. Okay. I mean, this Thank year she has taken a break, but she has been a math teacher at school from like almost ten fifteen okay. years. Okay. So. Okay. I mean, <clears throat> just before I start, let me uh, introduce myself a little bit. Actually, um, I started uh, teaching back in nineteen eighty two, when I was still a boy. Uh, thinking that teaching is something great because my father was a teacher. I thought I should be like my father. Um, you know, in the village, everybody respecting him and things like that. So I thought I should join as a teacher and join. And 1982 and 83 was uh, a crazy uh, year for me, both the years, because I was getting mad in school. Uh, I was always getting angry because uh, I thought teaching is just uh, taking up uh, the books from the children and asking them to open the books and shouting at them and, and they don't know 
fire them, or beat them, and slap them, things like that. So I was really, really crazy. So 82 and 83 just passed like that. Then 84, I got a chance to go to Darjeeling uh, to do my diploma in education. There I stayed in the hostel two years, completely on education. Education philosophy, education psychology, child psychology, methods of teaching, this, that, oh, very, very difficult. So somehow uh, at the end of two years, uh, we passed, uh, we got through the training. Then after that, uh, then my teaching uh, completely changed. Uh, the style of teaching changed. So the children remember me. 1982, 83, the children remember me as a very angry, frustrated teacher. Uh, I used to, and they still tell me, oh, I used to really, really shout at us, uh, you know, beat us, things like that. But after 86, after I came back from Brazil, then the children remember me as a very, very calm and, you know, very interesting teacher. They, they refer to some of the quotes that I did, and I forgot actually, but they remember those things. So I think I left a very good impact. Oh, Pranita, Miss, thank you so much. Uh, so we can talk later on about. <laughs> I feel at home when I when I when I meet somebody from Darjeeling because I I lived there in West Bengal for a long time, and in Darjeeling for two years and went many times to Darjeeling. So I have some of my friends there still who are teaching in Mount Amani School and uh, some some other schools. Okay, then uh, then somehow I then I continued teaching from eighty six. Then uh, I got a chance to go to Scotland uh, in nineteen ninety three to do a course on environmental education in Strathclyde University in Glasgow. Then after that course, I realized that, oh, this is the education that we should be doing. We should be advocating. It was on environmental education. And then I realized how much we have encroached the earth. We have troubled this, the, the very earth that is feeding us, that is given us birth, things like that. Then I continued working as an environment educator uh, from 1993, as soon as I joined an NGO, I got a chance to go to UK. Then from 94, then I started uh, sharing this with the teachers, training teachers on environmental projects and things like that. I developed a lot of eco club manuals and things like that. Then in 2006, again, I got a, another chance to go to Sweden to do an advanced course on ESD, Education for Sustainable Development. So the history, I'll tell you a little bit. Uh, it all started with, with nature education in, in the US and in, 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 in everywhere, learning about nature. Then this, they called it conservation education. No, learning about nature is not enough. We have to conserve it because without nature, uh, we are going to die soon because nature gives us everything. We have to uh, live with the nature because our forefathers lived with the nature because there's a lot of forest, a lot of wildlife. That's why today when we, we always want to go to the zoo to see tigers, or elephants and things. Why? Because right inside, deep inside our instinct, we have some relationship. We, we wanted to be with that because we were with those animals. So then after that, uh, then the, the concept of environment, uh, the, the conservation education says, no, in the conservation education only means wildlife. There's a lot of other, other parameters to add on. So they added environment, it's a man-made environment also into the natural environment, natural, natural environment and made with environment. Then environmental education, it used to be called in, uh, environmental education uh, for a few years. Then they called it environment and development education because environment is destructed in the name of development. We are developing by, 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 crushing the natural things by deforesting, by clearing the forest, we are marginalizing all the wildlife and we are building our homes. And today we see, we say that, oh, uh, now elephants have finished our crops. Tigers have come and uh, uh, you know, taken our chickens and things. But actually, we, they are not encroaching actually. We have encroached their lands. Now they are coming to find their you know, original uh, habitats. So that's the thing. Then uh, they put a different dimension into environmental education, the social dimension and the economic dimension. So ESD actually uh, means education for sustainable development and on three pillars, society, environment, and economy. 
in the name of economic development, we have finished the, in that. So that's how. Uh, this is a kind of a brief background before I start my slides. Uh, let me see what's in the, okay. So let me now uh, share my slides and I want you to think a little bit. Uh, yeah. So. So education for sustainable development, this is the topic for today. And I'll be talking about how we can incorporate in different subject areas by understanding this, because I feel that without understanding a bit of ESD, education for sustainable development, uh, I strongly feel that is uh, quite useless to be teaching. So every teacher today in the 21st century, uh, and when we are dealing with the 21st century children, I think this needs to be understood by every teacher and then incorporate these things in different subjects. I'll, I'll show you how it's done. So now this picture is there. Uh, what do you understand by looking at this picture? I want you to just write in the chat box, uh, just study this picture for one minute and see what you see. Evolution chart, okay. Uh, I'm waiting for the for your for your uh, from fungi to human being, okay. Jake is sir, thank you so much. You can still write more of your ideas. And everybody, I want everyone to write biodiversity. Gwon sir, thank you so much. Uh, I want everyone to, everyone as far as possible. What do you understand from this chart? Uh, least developed to most developed brain, life beyond humans. Okay, that's good. Because in the brainstorm session, nobody is wrong, everybody is right because we look at things from different perspective. Uh, so a human being being shown as the most egoistic compared to other beings. Yes, framework of biodiversity. Okay, Okay. Uh, well done. Uh, <clears throat> so here, I'll have another counteract, uh, counteracting picture at the end. So here, you can see at the bottom of the pyramid, all the microorganisms, the little higher animals, the higher animals and higher animals and like that. Then you can see here one human figure. This is a female, uh, I mean, women figure, female figure here, and there's a man figure here. So this very clearly shows that we are trying to take over the ecosystem. We are claiming and we have claimed ourselves. Humans have claimed themselves as the, as the, as the, on, the on the top of the ecosystem. And we always felt, ever since we started living on this planet, we always felt, oh, the dog is for me, the tree is for me, the tiger is for me, we have to kill it, finish it. The tree is for me, let's finish it. Everything has to be finished in the name of pleasure, in the name of development, in the name of our own, um, uh, you know, uh, our, 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 you know, you using things. Use and throw, utilitarian kind of view. Utilize, finish off. Without even thinking about the tomorrow, what happens tomorrow. So that way, that way, we have, been, we have evolved. We have evolved. The humans have this in mind. We have to really change this. Because even today also, we always think that we are on the top of an ecosystem. And we have to finish it off everything. Everything is for us. The tiger's bones are for us. The, the uh, rhino's horn is for us. Everything has to be for us, and we have to finish it off. The fish is for us, the whale is. So whaling, there's a lot of whaling companies. Everything is for us. So this, this ego of the human beings has really, really disrupted the environment. 
disrupted the nature, disrupted the arts ecosystem, then the, the working. So we are going against the nature. So a lot of ecologists and environmentalists today, what they say is that uh, is the result of human intervention, too much of intervention, unsustainable intervention that we are facing today. The earth is now telling us to stay back at home, take rest. We want to uh, once again uh, revitalize our natural system. So that's why the nature has produced this uh, virus called Corona. That's what people say, the environmentalists. They always say that we have encroached uh, the nature too much. So disrupted. So it's a result of all these kind of uh, wrong interventions. Okay. So we will uh, we'll start from here. Now let me take you to a picture. Uh, everybody knows that the earth is about 4.5 or 4.6 billion years old. Uh, ever since it started uh, in the, to a, uh, what do you call that, Big Bang Theory. So let's imagine that this six point, uh, sorry, 4.6 billion years is fitted in one hour clock. One hour clock, let's imagine for some time, just to understand that this 4.6 billion years is fitted into a one hour clock. So when does the earth form? The earth crust forms at 0 0.01 minute. So there are in minutes, it's all in minutes. So 0 0.01 minute is a fraction of a second the earth crust formed. And the oldest rocks uh, on the earth crust was formed at around 10 minutes, uh, 27 seconds. And the first fossil, you can see the first fossil evidence of life is the, uh, the unicellular organism. Actually, it all started in the water because the water was formed after the earth cooled. So until this time, the, the, the earth was very hot. It was a hot ball of fire, there's no life. So then the water formed, after the water formed, then the, through some chemical reactions, a Purnima man will be able to tell how it all happened <laughs> later on to clarify, I'm not a scientist. So, so the life appeared, but it was a very, very simple form, the unicellular organism. So the first fossil evidence of life uh, was uh, found, uh, it happened in 13 minutes, uh, zero four seconds. And the first bacteria actually appeared in 17 minutes and 37 seconds. So the primitive life con uh, continued, the air chemistry was entirely different because only very primitive life uh, lived there. And uh, now if I ask somebody, when did, the, when, when, uh, when did your grandfather leave? or grandfather's 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 leave. When I ask you this question, you might say, oh, it's a long time ago, long time ago, because we are calculating everything from the human time. Because we live hardly for 70, 80 years, and we are calculating from that time. Oh, for us, 200 years is very, very long. Oh, so far away. But if the, if the earth was to speak, but if the earth was to speak, it would say that, oh, the first dinosaur, the dinosaur was just very recent. You know? 57 minutes, it's just, it's just very recent. 57.1 second minute. And the first mammal, I, mean, I just didn't talk about these things because as you can visible, you can see. So it's all very recent, you know. The multiple uh, organisms, multiple uh, uh, multicellular organisms appeared very, very late. Actually, the life is very primitive for a long time, many billion years. So the first mammal appeared in 57 minutes and 0 0.07 minutes. Very, very recent. If the earth was to, if the earth can speak, then the earth would say, say that, ah, you people, what do you, what do you call yourself? It just came very recently. First human ancestor, the first bird, see, 57.59 minutes. First human ancestor, our first, the first human being, Homo sapien appeared at 59.58 minutes. Very, very recent. And the first modern man, we claim as modern man, appeared at 59.59.01. Oh, sorry, nine minutes. Very recent. So we are the last uh, species to appear on this planet. But for us, because 
we are calculating from the human time. Uh, we feel that it was a long time ago. But from the Earth's perspective, from the evolution perspective, from the ecological time perspective, from the geological time perspective, uh, we have come very, very recently, a fraction of a second. So there are 3,600 seconds in an hour. And the modern human appeared, human appeared at 59.59.9. That means at 0 0.0.1 second per minute. Let's say I think I don't know how I don't know how I put it, but it's very, very fraction of a second. And during this very time, very short time, we have pushed this earth. Our earth is the common home. Now we say that we are from India, we are from Bengaluru. We are from Surkhet, or we are from Nepal, Guns, or from Kathmandu. But if we all meet on the on a different planet, suppose we are in Mars, then we would always say that we all belong to the Earth. Where is your home? You know, my man, she will tell. Oh, I, I am from the Earth. So I think we have to we have to think from this perspective that we are all uh, we are all you know started from the same little uh, kind of a multi, uh, unicellular organism. From one cell, we have now multiplied into so many people, so many plants, so many animals and insects. So we're all same actually. And we have the same earth, only one earth, only one living uh, earth. So uh, which, is, which, is a, uh, which is able to support our life. So our common home. And we have pushed this to the brink of exhaustion. Now, Mother Earth, we, in our culture, in many of the cultures, we call Earth as Mother, Prithivi Mata, Prithivi Mata. And we all, because the moment we are born, until we die, we use everything that is produced from the Earth, from different natural products. The, the clothes that we are wearing, the computer that we have in front of us, Whatever we are using, everything is from that. So that's why maybe we have called Earth as Mother Earth. So in a very short time, we have finished this Earth. So today we are forced to breathe, drink, and eat poison. <coughs> lot of chemicals, lot of pesticides. As it is, we have to wear masks in the cities, city areas even without corona also because of the dust and pollution and a lot of uh, you know, pollutants, a lot of vehicular exhausts. But now, again, it has become worse. We are not able to breathe good air. We're not able to, uh, because that's the first thing that we require, breathing. We always forget that air is so important. Now, it's, the importance has, uh, it has, uh, it has uh, come up because of the oxygen cylinder shortage everywhere. The, the need to the, the, the value of oxygen and so it's, it's a free in the nature and we have spoiled it and drinking although we are in a very in a water uh, you know abundant area but uh, we are we always think we have to buy a bottle of water and drink that's the better water but we don't know whether that water is really good or not and eating poison all the pesticides in the in the agriculture farms so we have finished everything today. Now there's a, a YouTube. Uh, I hope uh, the sound will be shared. Uh, and I want you to see this, watch this uh, uh, video very short. It's about three, three, to, three to four minutes. So. Uh, These days, there is a lot to balance. But Grammarly ensures you communicate Earth, oceans, atmosphere. These interconnected systems exist in a delicate balance that has kept conditions on our planet relatively stable. For Can you hear? Yeah, no, we, have, we have to share the window where it is playing. We are not able to see. We can hear clearly. Oh, okay, okay. So let me... Okay, okay, okay. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I got you. I'll just stop here. Stop and just play again. Yeah, sure. Can you see now? 
atmosphere. These interconnected systems exist in a delicate balance that has kept conditions on our planet relatively stable for the past 12,000 years. This stability helped humanity flourish. But as our population and civilizations have grown, we've pulled more and more resources away from these life support systems, diverting water, land and minerals to agriculture, industry and urban development. People began to wonder, would these pressures eventually prove too much? In 2007, Johan Rockström and Will Steffen set out to answer a fundamental question. What is the safe operating space for humanity on planet Earth. In other words, what are the limits of key Earth system processes that we cannot exceed if we want to avoid rapid and catastrophic environmental change? Working with an international team of scientists, they define nine processes that keep Earth's life support system stable. They also estimated the limits of how far we could change and exploit these processes before the system would pass a threshold of no return. They suggested limits, called planetary boundaries, guardrails to keep us a safe distance from these catastrophic tipping points. In the 1980s, scientists found that chemicals called CFCs were degrading the ozone layer, a thin atmospheric layer that absorbs some of the dangerous wavelengths of ultraviolet radiation from the sun and acts like a protective layer of sunscreen for the planet. But ozone-damaging CFCs were being used then all over the world in refrigerators, aerosol cans and other products. Alarming satellite data revealed a dangerous thinning of ozone over the Antarctic. In response to this existential threat, the world's nations met in 1987 and signed the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer they started phasing out CFC use. Today, the ozone layer is in recovery, and it's hoped the damage to this vital life support system will be repaired by 2050. Humanity, for the first time, had stepped back from overshooting a planetary boundary. In addition to the ozone layer, Rockstrom and Stefan identified eight other planetary boundaries. Biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus, climate change, ocean acidification, freshwater consumption, biodiversity, land system change, atmospheric aerosol pollution, and chemical pollution. Because these processes are interlinked, passing a threshold in one area can lead to a cascade of changes, destabilizing other systems, causing them to topple like dominoes beyond our control. For example, climate change, a planetary boundary, is triggered by increasing atmospheric carbon emissions. But that excess carbon also causes ocean acidification, a second planetary boundary which in turn impacts marine species like corals and fish, destabilizing biodiversity, yet another planetary boundary. Likewise, deforestation by agribusiness in huge tropical forests, as seen in the Amazon, reduces the amount of water evaporating from leaves, which reduces rainfall, causing forests to transition into dry savannas and possibly altering weather systems across entire continents. In this case, land use change helps generate climate change, which diminishes biodiversity, which brings more climate change. Diverse ecosystems are essential to provide us with food, clean water, materials, medicine, even flood defences. And it's these ecosystem services that are vital to the human future. Estimates suggest we're already living outside the safe zone for at least four of the nine planetary boundaries, putting Earth on course for disruptive changes in our life support system not experienced for tens of thousands of years. The concept of planetary boundaries was developed as a guide to help us keep Earth conditions within a safe range. Now, Overshoot underlines the urgency of the sustainability crisis confronting us. But the first planetary boundary we crossed offers us a hopeful path ahead. If nations can come together, as they did to meet the CFC threat to the ozone layer, then we can address climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and more. Then there's a chance we can reverse current trends and steer Earth's key life support systems back to the safe, habitable zone again. So, thank you so much. Uh, can I ask you, what key words did you listen uh, in, in the commentary or in the, in the, in the, in the visuals? Uh, you can either uh, unmute and uh, speak or, uh, yes, Sudha, ma'am. Uh, climate change and environment. Yes, thank you so and much. Then, uh, Uh, any other uh, uh, ozone? Yes, sir. Ozone. Yes, ozone. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, overstepping the uh, uh, planetary boundaries. Yes, yes. And uh, the way I mean, our one action can lead to uh, chain reaction and like overstepping into like multiple boundaries at the same time, like carbon emission. Yes, yes. Very true. Very true. 
So a mistake uh, in, in one of the one of the boundaries, like uh, nine uh, planetary boundaries, one mistake in one one of the boundaries can hamper and connect uh, has a effect a chain effect on the other. And uh, it says that uh, we are we have already reached the threshold of no return actually. But there is a chance that it will all work together because we are no longer uh, uh, you know isolated actually. Uh, maybe 100 years ago, we were isolated because if there was a disease in Nepal, it never went out of Nepal because there was no movement of people and uh, there is no communication, transport, things like that. But now, because of the transport and communication, we are so much interconnected, even digitally. So we are connected here digitally. So, and uh, sometimes even physically, uh, we move a lot of, uh, a lot of people move about. And this is what has, uh, uh, you know, uh, affected the, uh, the reaction of the virus actually, the pandemic now present is because of the people's uh, you know, uh, movement. So now it's not like before, now it's no longer a kind of a uh, local uh, problem. Every problem that we have a kind of a, um, a relation with uh, international problem, a global problem, and all the global problems that we have, yes, all the global problem that we have has a connection with what we do every day. For example, CFC, the, the, the ozone depletion, we are all using the fridge, uh, sometimes even unnecessarily. Now we have ozone-free uh, kind of uh, ozone, ozone uh, uh, this uh, refrigerators also without ozone, some different chemicals which doesn't harm the ozone layer. But uh, it says that uh, ozone uh, layer, uh, when it was found in the 80s, it was a problem now because everybody, the Montreal uh, declaration uh, has corrected it. So like that, if we all work together, because everybody, every one of us is affected with the, with the issue because it's no more a kind of a, um, uh, what you call epidemic. It's a kind of pandemic, everything, even diseases. Any issue that we have here in India can trigger a, some problem in Nepal or China or America or Canada. So it's no longer a kind of a you know, local kind of a issue. It's, it's, it's become an international global issue. Had it been a uh, hundred years, 200 years ago, maybe yes, it would have been because maybe people never moved, but now it's impossible because we are very, very closely interconnected and interdependent. A lot of, uh, not only people, move but a lot of goods move a lot of things from india come to nepal a lot of things from nepal go to india a lot of things come from america from australia so in our homes if you look at we have items from all over the world all parts of the world so we are intricately connected interdependent uh, but also uh, we are in a big problem we are already having a big problem because as you can see there are nine planetary boundaries two are not quantified others are quantified. So climate change is one of the biggest issue now. Ocean acidification is one, but climate change is hitting everywhere, especially the Himalayan countries and the coastal areas. Uh, they are badly hit by climate change. So uh, a lot of tsunamis, uh, no rain, sometimes torrential rain, sometimes drought and things like that, no crops. So this will really have an effect on poverty, hungry people, deaths and diseases, things like that. So it will really, really, it has a same effect. So this is what the, the short movie is trying to tell. And thank you uh, everyone for sharing deterioration of environment due to human action, Pinky ma'am, bone sir, most of the rare flora and fauna, birds of extinction, yes, they're already dying. A lot of animals have already, are already dead. We can't now make them, we, we can't, uh, reconstruct these animals like dodo bird in Mauritius. It, it it has gone forever. A white tiger has gone forever from the world, so we can't make it. So we can see only maybe in the movies like dinosaurs. In the in some of the movies, they make di real dinosaurs, but real we can't see. So it's all because of human intervention, our ego. Every everything is for me. That is the that is the feeling that we have. So let me continue with the uh, with the with the PowerPoint again. So now I'll give you a kind of uh, uh, 
little bit of work again. What are the new challenges on science and society, the global crisis? So what may, what are the global crises that you think of apart from what is being told in the movie? So you can write in the chat box. Uh, and what do you think? You know, you may be thinking something different. You know, you can write even local, local issues. That has, as I already told you, uh, a connection with the global issue. So I just give you one minute. Just write words on the part of the global crisis. Decrease in emotional connect. Yes, because we are so much uh, into material uh, world, and the emotions are and this uh, the misuse of mobile phones actually has disconnected our family members, but we are connected outside with outside world. So a lot of things are there, development or destruction, we are in confusion, yes. We have to develop, but without destroying, that's what we're going to talk today. Without destroying also, there, there's a possibility of development, but so far, everywhere in the world, especially in European countries, in the First World War, uh, Second World War, they destroyed a lot of nature. They destroyed their forests. From the forest, they, uh, they, they constructed big, big ships, warships. Now they can't grow this, those, those original trees are gone. Balancing between uh, genuine needs of growing population, yes, complex reasons and necessary, um, necessary preservatives. So growing population is the main issue, human population. Social connection is very less these days, yes. Social connection, very good. It's all because the, the, the more people and more competition, no cooperation. So instead of competition, now we have to go for cooperation. Too busy to think and realize that we need to slow down and live in true tune with nature without exploiting natural resources. Very good, sir. Thank you so much. So these are some of the issues. So let me now go to the next slide. <clears throat> this is all about ESD. ESD aims to solve the global crisis. Whatever crisis we have got, all the nine planetary boundaries and whatever things we have got, we, we just wrote, ESD is the only solution. That is what the UNESCO has really uh, declared. UNESCO is leading the ESD program all over the world and the sustainable development goals are being endorsed by uh, by UNESCO. So ESD means Education for Sustainable Development, I already told, and it was defined, sustainable development was defined in our common future in 1987, saying that development that meets the needs of the present, present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So it's not that we have to only finish everything and utilize everything, but we have to give the earth back to the children, our future generations, the way it was handed over to us by our forefathers, actually in a better shape. So it is said that the earth is not given by our forefathers, but it is borrowed from our children. So we have, when we borrow things, suppose I borrow your pen and I give you broken pen, I mean, after breaking it, you would not like it. So similarly, the children are given us a very good earth. So we have to give back the same earth in a very good condition. Without, we have to do the development, but without harming the environment, with a very, very minimal impact on the environmental components, the natural components. So it was uh, during the UN World Commission on Environment and Development in 1987, uh, in, uh, in, uh, it, was, uh, it was in the, the, one of the Scandinavian countries, right now I forgot, I, th I think it was in, uh, not in Sweden, Finland, no, Norway, I think, no, Norway. I think. So, so the United Nations decade of, so the, the decade was there 2015 to 14, uh, 2000, sorry, 2005 to 15, for 10 years, uh, we called it, uh, we called it D, uh, DESD, Decade of Education for Social Development. And there it says that education for social development is a life-wide and lifelong learning endeavor. It doesn't stop uh, after the um, PhD or after any um, formal education. It continues until the end, and it has to continue until the end because it's life-wide and lifelong. Because 
the moment we are born, we, we use the air, we use water, we use food, clothes and everything, whatever, all the tertiary requirements. And it continues until the end. So the person, anybody uh, from child, from all the races, all the colors, all the creed, all the caste, everybody from, so as in a 21 in 1993, 1992, there was a earth summit in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And they have actually charted out a, a, a kind of a declaration for Agenda 21. So everything it has got. Agenda 21 is, Agenda 21 is the thing for Agenda uh, for 21st century. Yes, DBSC, ma'am. You have raised your hand. DBSC, ma'am, I saw you. Uh, yes, sir. The currently what you are speaking that uh, uh, the coming generations, uh, uh, what they miss out, uh, it's happening already. Uh, the kids cannot play outside because of this, yeah. this corona and all, uh, which yeah. is actually the result of whatever environmental destruction yes. uh, yes. we've done, or our future uh, previous generations have done. Yes. So yes. Uh, already we are, we are experiencing all these things. Yes, yes, yes. Ma it's very sad, actually. Yes, you are very true. We've already uh, done too much to the environment, done too much to the earth, that our children are not able to, because our, what our forefathers enjoyed, you know, our forefathers enjoyed the nature. And they were much stronger than us because they were all uh, having organic food. Now we are into chemical food, all the you know chemicals we are eating. So uh, we have become more, much, much weaker and weaker. So it's a sad state, but together if we all work, hopefully we will all sort out. So uh, let me continue. Uh, we have to all work together and view tomorrow as a day that belongs to all of us. Otherwise, if we don't work together, because we are, uh, as I told you, we are no more disconnected. We are so much connected. We can all work together because one effect, one small like, problem here in one part of the country can trigger, like Corona actually started in a very small city in China, and now it's all over the world because we are so much interconnected. So. If we don't work the way we should be working in terms of education, now I'm talking about education, we can do a lot because if we can train a child, train a child's mind the way we should, one day he or she will become the minister of environment and give the right decision on what we should be doing. But right now, that is not happening. If we don't act all together, the that it will not belong to everyone, anyone means tomorrow will not belong to anyone. We may all die. This is, uh, this is the statement from UNESCO, not from me. So we have to all really work together. And uh, uh, UNESCO has been working for this uh, for uh, so many years. And uh, now uh, we have got, we had actually MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals from 2001 to 15. And they evaluated it and uh, there were eight goals only. And they found out that poverty was a little bit plus and that they could uh, overcome some part of poverty uh, kind of that goal was poverty. That goal was quite good. Otherwise other goals were, was not that satisfactory. <clears throat> so in September, uh, 2015, uh, again, UN uh, called different countries, stakeholders from different parts of the world and they sat and they drafted another uh, kind of a global agenda, which is popularly called uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and it is going up to 30. So we're already in 21, so nine more years, six years, uh, six years has gone from 16. And I had a very, uh, very big opportunity to attend one of the conferences, um, uh, global conferences, in, uh, which, took which took place in Ahmedabad in India uh, in 2016, January. Uh, the the main agenda was the the theme for the uh, the global uh, the conference was education as a driver for SDGs. Education as a driver means if education is different, if education is done in a different way, because the kind of education that we are doing will not bring any results, but we have to change a little bit of our system, our approach, then it can really help others. Uh, other other uh, goals to achieve their um, targets. So there are uh, uh, 17 goals and 169 targets. 
So some of the challenges on science and society, environment degradation, climate change, health and diseases. This is the strategy, UN strategy. Economic meltdown, inequalities, because uh, we have haves and have -nets. Some people have, actually 80% of the people are hungry. 20% of the global population is utilizing 80% of the resources. And 20% of the uh, resources are distributed among 80% of the uh, population. So this is inequality is there. Uh, health and disease, as we know, we are suffering now. Economic meltdown because of, so they are all again interconnected because of Corona, we have, our economy has really gone down. Migration because of the diseases, because of conflicts, wars, violence, they are all interconnected. So as a 21st century teacher, what do we do now? is to bring these things, bring these uh, issues into the class, into the plans, into the, uh, it, so by giving examples of different parts of the world, our local examples can be given. So you can go more of global, I call it global, G-L-O-C-L, global. And the foremost thing, the main thing is teacher education, because unless we start training the teachers, retraining the teachers, reorienting the teachers on ESD is going to be difficult because we are teaching in a very, very conventional manner. We're teaching them to memorize hard facts. You know, some, some, you know, some uh, theories and things like that and write those theories in the classroom and the exams in the class. So we have to now start the change project. So the change project is the training, teacher education, because Albert Einstein, has said that we cannot change anything with the same thought that we had when we created these issues. We have to change our thought process. So I'll now try to connect it with yesterday's thing <laughs> about relearning, unlearning, unlearning and learning, relearning. So I think we have to really start thinking in a different way, uh, how we can change our teaching system, how we can change our thought processes. So. Let me now go one second to this revision of the slide, but all the uh, all the problems that we have are now spelled out in uh, the SDGs. The 17 goals and goal four is the quality education, which actually drives all the other goals. So we have to start training our teachers with a different kind of a thought process, change thought process. So the new paradigm of education, what does it say? The education must promote sensitivities to gender equity, diversity, and other factors. Whatever we have discussed all the issues, it has to uh, integrate the element, uh, these elements into our teaching system. You can take the uh, screenshot actually, if you really want, no problem. And yes, it needs to be sensitive to uh, support and enhance celebration of multiplicity in culture because uh, we are a lot of diversity now in culture. Uh, we, are, we are from different cultural uh, backgrounds, and languages and society, as well as diversity in the natural world. So we have, we have so many things in nature, even among the people, races, kinds. So everybody has to really work together. There's no, there's no time now. It's a very high you know, time that we have to all work together, irrespective of where we are from, what we do, and where where we belong. So this is a kind of a global. Uh, we we also call it global citizenship education. So so the new paradigm of education must be participatory and learner centered. Uh, so far, now until now, in many places, even today. Uh, I see uh, teacher-driven education, conventional uh, kind of system, theory, passing on the theory, and um, making them understand what we, and making them believe on what we say, and uh, without giving them a chance to think and um, any freedom to express things like that. So the children are now, because they have, uh, they have a different pedagogy now, they want to learn in a different way. They are no longer interested in the books, they want to learn in a different way. They want to do some project works. They want to go outside. So the, because then they're exposed to a lot of uh, IT now, they are faster than us. We always think they are 
steward than us. We are the um, filled up uh, pots and they are empty vessels. No, it's, it's just the opposite. If you ask the child about something, the child can tell you 10 times, 10, 10 different things about the same thing because they're exposed more into the IT and um, a lot of uh, ICT materials are educated there. So ESD should empower and enable children to learn where, when, what, and how best. It's, it's up to the choice, choice of the children. So they should be able to, so we have to draft the uh, whole system together. We have to sit together and draft the whole system together. And it is possible. Uh, but our education system doesn't allow that, but I have tried it out in the school that I worked. Uh, and uh, uh, I've tried it out until class seven, because eight, there is a board exam, nine and 10, they have a kind of, again, board exam. So, but I have tried this up to class seven. Uh, we have done a lot of exercises in the schools that I worked previously, which is possible. So the paradigm of education uh, recognizes that uh, education is a critical agent of transformation. Uh, so far we have been transferring the knowledge, but now we have to transform the lives of the children in the lives, uh, the, way, the, the way that we live and the, and the attitude, because our work is very important in working on their attitudes, the thinking process, that attitude once corrected will have it uh, positive behavior. So it will, and as the increased participation. When the children understand things from their heart, when they internalize things, then the automatic action will come. But many a times what we do is, we just shout at the children when they throw a plastic bottle or plastic bag something. We shout at them, make them pick up. They do it because of the fear, but we, if we can really educate them, what happens to the plastic, where, where does it end up? Then the internalization will take place and they will change their behavior, they will change their attitude. So that's very important. So education has to uh, play this uh, role of changing the attitude of the children. As in, in, in visioning the, and visioning and realizing a sustainable work. So the children should be able to think for the future. Even the teachers have to uh, teach for the future. So futuristic education, we also call it futuristic education. Why, should, why are we teaching for a bright future? Everybody says that, oh, I'm learning. Every parent will say, oh, I am taking my child to the school for a bright. So what is a bright future? Bright future means a healthy future, quality life. So quality life means quality air, quality food, and quality water. That's the first thing that we require. We, don't, we may not require clothes because we didn't have clothes, but we had these three elements when we were uh, when we were uh, when we were made when we existed in the beginning air was important water was important and food was important clothes was not important clothes we started wearing few hundred years few thousand years ago so in visioning and realizing such so where are we going how should we move on so that we can live longer we can sustain on this earth we are not pushing the earth to the brink of exhaustion. We are safely operating within the earth's working system. So that's what we have to think. For capacity building and facilitating participation of communities, because uh, we call it, uh, schools, we call it as a kind of a light of the society. Uh, if there is a school, the whole community becomes lighted up. That's what we think. So we have to work with the communities. Uh, uh, we can work together. So whoever is here participating, I can share further uh, resources. You can email me uh, because I've worked uh, in the past with the communities. I'm still actually supposed to go to a village with a climate change education program, but because of pandemic, I'm stuck. Uh, we were start, uh, planning to start uh, uh, last year, April. Uh, we, we couldn't. This year, April, I was supposed to go and start. So I can share some of the uh, resources, some of the ideas that I have. Uh, <clears throat> done there. So communities is very important. So community work, community understanding of the community and the children and school and community working together will really uh, make a big change in doing anything, planning together and acting on together is very important. So how do you implement uh, in the classroom? So integration. Integration is very important because uh, the way uh, uh, environmental issues are interconnected, 
somebody from engineering background, uh, I mean, two or three people here, you can very much uh, integrate the elements of ESG, uh, elements of environmental components, society, societal components, economic components in, in, in the engineering. Um, thing. So STEAM is science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. So this is a very uh, uh, new uh, uh, terminology. Uh, but uh, this is not a new thing for me, actually. We call it integrated in the beginning. Uh, when I did my course in Darjeeling in 84-85, we called it integrated uh, uh, learning. And now it's called STEAM. And it's a hot kick at the moment. But it's a kind of uh, integration of all the subjects and also infusion. Yeah, infusion is, if you can't integrate, you can infuse the elements of ESD into your lessons. As far as possible, we should be able to integrate. And by uh, planning in a team, different subject teachers sit together, planning, plan a project. And if that is not possible, which in an infusion model. And by, because the children love to do project work. If you have tried and tested, children like to do outside and do a lot of research. And if you guide them with uh, some kind of a uh, framework or a kind of research guide, some questionnaire if you can build up, help them to build, then the results are very wonderful. I've done this many times. So I called it a mini research or micro projects also. And once you have done the project work, you have to do it again and again and again, just to see how it changed, whether the previous results have, the previous dissemination has really worked out, uh, what is needed, what changes have taken place in the same area. So just to have a look. So <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about um, different sub, uh, subject areas. Now languages now, when you, if you are talking about, if you are teaching a language, uh, English or Hindi or Kannada or Nepali or whatever, how would you integrate the elements of ESD? Because, you know, I just want to share experience. I was in one of the classrooms of a high school in Sweden. We were taken, and the teacher was so wonderful. She about a, an article about a, the, you know, the Chernobyl, uh, the, the gas of the, uh, what was the Chernobyl uh, disaster? The, um, what was there? What disaster you call? Puneem, ma'am, can you help me a little bit? Chernobyl in Russia. Uh, to uh, uranium, uranium. Yeah, no, there was a blast in that their nuclear plant. Nuclear plant, yes, nuclear. Yeah, yeah. and there is a news, a news uh, uh, paper. The, the, there was a kind of a news uh, in that paper, and she took out that news, photocopied it, and gave it to the children in the English class. And when the children did the exercise, the questions were in, framed in such a way. I was in the class observing for the whole you know, 40, 15 minutes. The children worked out. They learned the structure of the whole uh, thing, the language part, and they also learned a lot of about what happens if the there is a blast of <clears throat> nuclear plants. What would happen to the whole environment, the people, things that. So that way, I think uh, we can uh, uh, we can we can integrate in, in the language part a lot of uh, stories, plays on environmental themes and uh, drama and role play on environmental issues. Comprehension, you can uh, give them to write some essay on that, creative writing uh, and discussion on environmental topics. And they can do the presentation, they learn how to present it. So a lot of things can be done with the, uh, with the, by the language teacher. In media studies, uh, in environmental materials like newspaper reading and things like that, and presenting those things. And mathematics, because we have some math teachers here. And uh, when I went to, uh, schools uh, a long time ago, uh, asking them to give me some time for environmental talk, and environmental workshop. Uh, then they asked me, what's it all about? Uh, people are very new to environmental education. Uh, then I said, this is all about this thing. They said, oh, it's for social studies teacher, it's for geography teacher, it's for maybe for science teacher. But I said, no, everybody has to learn about uh, these elements um, of science uh, and environment. So mathematics, how do we do it? So we use environmental, uh, I mean, mathematics to interpret the environmental statistics. 
how much of the pollution is done, what is the effect, the percentage, and calculation, things like that. So mathematics can be used in, in, to interpret environmental statistics. Basic mathematical skills through case study in the local environment, because everything, everywhere, there's maths everywhere actually. So the children will learn a lot of concepts of maths while doing the project work. Estimating and calculating the probabilities, what would have happened if this was dumped, this, uh, much, uh, this amount of chemical was dumped into the river, something like some kind of probability case studies, things like that. And calculating distances, the river can travel, carrying the pollutants, the lengths and angles using environment built and natural. So maths, you can really use uh, to measure things and environmental issues and things like that. So maths is very much used, but what we do is we just go and teach the theory without bringing in any, any kind of issues and elements of uh, whatever we are facing. So we can bring whatever local issues are there into mathematics. And science is uh, quite direct. Chemical changes to the Earth's atmosphere because the air chemistry has changed. A lot of carbon monoxides and sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxides and all this, these oxides have gone up causing air pollution and uh, you know, uh, this climate change, global warming, you know. So the change in the air chemistry, energy, because now we have to really go for renewable energy. Uh, we have no fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is now finishing up and uh, we can, uh, it will take a billion years, a billion years to, uh, then to make fossil fuel. Petroleum is finishing, so we have to go for renewable energy. All these kind of th things can come in the science lessons. Pollution of food waves because of the chemical um, and uh, pesticides. A lot of um, uh, animals are dying, insects are dying, and it's affecting the food chain, things like that. And global warming in science, in technology, eco-friendly technology, environment friendly technology, how can we develop that? Uh, I got an opportunity to go to Japan uh, in one of the conferences in just before pandemic started, actually that was in November, 2019. I went to one of the schools. Uh, the, we were taken to see how the children, Japanese children learn. They are learning to build a traffic light. Although there are good traffic lights already in Japan, very good traffic system, but they are making something different with warning system and so many things without having uh, to, you know, be guided by the people or something like that. So they're all working you know, on, on the improvement of the technology that they already have. So that means they are working on the technology, on how we can uh, 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 filter the filter the gases, filter the dust from the industries and things like that. So a lot of things can happen. So using the technology, we can really work on uh, the environmental you know, uh, correction. We can correct a lot of environmental issues using technologies. And we can also use the IT, information technology, you can read a lot of issues. You may uh, go into the Google and uh, learn more about ESG and UNESCO, what it says. Uh, yeah, so it's all through ICT. And social studies, as I told you, uh, all the energy that we have uh, 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 used in the past, how people use the energy, they used bullocks and horses and things like that. But now it's changing. So bullocks and horses, when they use, they had no problem, no environmental issues. But now because of the machinery is more problem, so things like that. So you can go back and reflect. And the, you can also ask, this I've used it very much, this, this part I've used it very much in my project. So old people actually can tell a lot about the history and geography of the place, local people. What they felt 20, 40 years ago, what was the river like? close to them, the river, what was it like? Oh, they'll say, oh, we used to really go and swim, drink the water from the river, but now it's all heavily polluted. You can't even go close by. So, you know, so dirty. So like that. So if you can compare those things, use the people's uh, oral history from the elders, from the, you know, from the parents. So children can interview their parents. So even the in interviewing skills can also, um, can also improve. So carrying out initiatives to improve the local environments. 
So when the people are uh, connected by having this research, by planning the lesson in such a way that the children do the research, then together we can then carry out the initiatives to improve the local environment. I have done this, some of the work I have done. So I'm just telling this, I put it here because I've done it. So developing a critical appreciation of the concepts of sustainable development, stewardship and to guide them to be in charge of, to be responsible for conservation. So understand more about uh, sustainable development. What would happen if this doesn't happen? If ESG is not, uh, if, if ESG doesn't happen, what would happen and what has already happened? What would happen for the things like that? So futuristic thinking about the future. So as I told you, STEAM is an art connected there. Drawing, painting, a lot of children, I mean, they are not equally good in many things and all the subjects. So some can express more to arts uh, by having three-dimensional work uh, and by making some model and things like that. So to learn about environment and by comparing, I mean, composing, interpreting and performing music on environmental themes, they can sing songs, they can do a lot of drama, they can use a role play, they can um, make, they can uh, um, I mean, uh, write poems about the issues and theater technique to raise awareness on the, on the issue um, for the public. Uh, and uh, the best is uh, to show the, um, this theater wherever they have done the project work so that the people will know that, oh, these things has happened around our, our area. And uh, appreciating the environment within the outdoor activity, aesthetically uh, appreciate the aesthetic uh, things of the, of the environment, to be more aesthetic and uh, to appreciate the environment, to respect the environment and to conserve it. And uh, religious education, um, because many of our religions actually, there are some uh, kind of animals are there, uh, some plants are there, so we have to really appreciate. I think a lot of people these days are uh, becoming modern and, oh, this is old thing, we'll do this. No, actually our forefathers have uh, very carefully, thoughtfully, uh, very, very cleverly put all these things like uh, the cow, crow, and dogs, a um, lot of animals are associated with a lot of deities and gods, not only in the Eastern culture, but even in the Western culture. Uh, so they are very important. So we have to really uh, respect the world religions and uh, appreciate uh, the forefathers' work and really understand the real purpose of uh, having this, uh, this uh, uh, natural, um, you know, I, uh, natural things in the, in the religion. And now uh, the competencies that we have to um, uh, improve uh, or among the children is to there are six actually uh, concepts uh, providing useful reference ESD. So concepts is of uh, diversity. The children should be able to understand that we are not one people, we are different people, but we have to have a one thinking but there is a variety in animal kingdom and the plant kingdom and any kingdom. There's a diversity, there's nothing called one thing. There are so many things, there is a variety. And those varieties, varieties of things are interdependent. We are related to each other in, in some one way or the other. And that there is a limit of everything. There's a limit of everything. There's a limited water, there's a limited air, there's a limited trees, limited animals, limited, everything is limited. Limited resources, limited petroleum. So there's a limitation of everything. And we have to have fair, we have to value everybody's opinion, everybody is equally important. And we have to really cooperate and work together by being more responsible and taking responsibility and coming down to action. Just by understanding, oh, I have understood, I've got positive, no, that will not work. You have to really come down to action. It's like celebrating World Environment Day. It's uh, out of 365 days, we celebrate half a day on the 5th of June, and we forget the other 364 days. That's, that doesn't, every day has to be World Environment Day. We have to be responsible. So competencies and attitudes to be emphasized 
is to ability to think critically, ability to plan with anticipation of a future scenario, multidimensional and integrative thinking and communication skills, ability to cooperate with others, respect of relations and connections. So what we call it GCED, GSET, Global Citizenship Education. Uh, by the way, you can all take this uh, free course from, uh, they, they offer it from Korea. There's a selection, uh, which is a bigger course for the safety people, but you can have a free course also. It's very good. I've done it. I've done both. So I really recommend uh, you to do it. <clears throat> and proactive participation without being told. So we have, we have to develop the children in such a way that they do the actions without being told all the time. So for that, they have to really, we have to work on changing the attitudes. Now for the teachers, uh, actually UNESCO has added one or two more, but I feel that these five things will be, these five competencies are very important, the basic ones. So systems thinking competence. So as 21st century teachers, we have to have these five comp basic competencies they are the systems thinking competence. This means that we should be able to see um, the thing as a whole in a very um, systemic way that everything is connected. It's, uh, it's not by part and part, but part as a whole. You know, there's a whole picture. Everything is uh, interconnected. The ability to see, understand, and relate different parts in the system. So economic. Uh, um, economic issues can have an uh, environmental impact. This can have a social impact. This can have a political impact. So all these things are all connected actually. So the ability to see it as a system, as a, as a kind of a single picture, whole picture. So anticipatory competence is the competence to be able to think about the future. What can happen if we do this? The ability to analyze things, critically analyze things, about the current situation and to, to analyze about the future, to project the future, to predict the future with as possible outcomes. So this is another uh, kind of a competency. The thing that the third one is that the normative, because we have a lot of values and to, we, we are living with a lot of values and it's very difficult to change the value system. And, Sometimes it's because of the value, we are not able to change the people's, we are not able to make a desired change because the value is deeply rooted into the system, into the culture. So we have to really respect these uh, values and understand, and very slowly we have to work on this. It, this is the most difficult uh, part, I feel, uh, among all this. But we have to really work with the people and see what good things are there in the system. And if the good things are there, which is doing good for everything, yes, we have to recognize it. That not all only only bad things; they are good things also. Like in our lot of cultural, um, you know, uh, you know, in our culture, there are a lot of things which are very eco-friendly. A lot of eco-friendly things are there, but we uh, we 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 just forget. We just take it for granted. Oh, this is an old system. People are doing it just for the sake of it. No, there is a science behind it. So if it's doing good, respect it, improve it. But if something is bad, like the dowry system and uh, like the witch, you know, uh, you know, a lot of societies, people call witch and they, they just beat, beat the witch, the women uh, suffering. So all these things have to be, you know, slowly thrown out of the society and it will take time. Now this is the, and the education has to work on this. The other one is the strategy competence. Like suppose you have got, systems thinking competence and separatory normative. But now if you don't know how to plan it properly, design and implement the interventions, so wherever you want to <coughs> intervene, it's quite difficult. So we have to also uh, develop strategy, uh, strategy in planning, you know, lesson plan, in a, a working system of the school, the whole system has to, the whole school system has to work. Then the other one is the interpersonal competence like the ability to create an environment that enables people to learn from each other. 
like what we are doing now. We should share and learn from each other. So holy school efforts, now we have to work together. Keeping the ESG as a package, as a kind of a main uh, working system. Okay? A lot of schools in the in Finland and the Scandinavian um, education system, they have the ESG as a background. Positioning ESG in the school's education system and management strategy. Promoting ESG as an organization, because one person in the school cannot do it. <clears throat> Just do a big team work. ESG outside the curriculum, like uh, in the ECA activities, the extracurricular activities also. Even outside, when you go out for the nature excursion, things like that, in inter-school cooperation and learning environment, different schools cooperating together, working together, and information sharing. This is very important because uh, information sharing will give you an idea of what is going on in the other part of the world and the other part of the uh, town, and you can share yours like, and exchange with other schools. Like <clears throat> communication is very important. So the four and five C's of teaching today, communicative, creative, critical, and collaboration and things like that. So we have to really work on those areas and exchange with other schools. Now I'm coming to the end of my talk. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just uh, once again, go back to the first slide that I uh, showed you about the ego. Now, we have seen all these issues. Uh, we have seen the videos and we all have already experienced a lot of issues, short as a water in the town, short as a petrol sometimes, short as a medicine at the moment, short as we have oxygen cylinders at the moment. So, Everything is all because of the ego. Ego. So we have to really move from ego to ego. So this ego, because we have put here on the top of the ecosystem, we feel that, oh, we have to rule the world. Very, very utilitarian kind of thing. But our forefathers, actually, our rishis and munis, actually, they were in the nature. They were like this. They are amongst, amongst everything. So we are like like the other animals, we are all together with respect. So <clears throat> we have to be eco-friendly. We have to be living within the uh, within the carrying capacity of the planet, within the carrying capacity of the environment. So this is the message that I want to give from move from ego to eco. And the, the thing is that anybody who misses environment education or education for sustainable development, ESD today, will be a blind individual tomorrow in thought and actions. So ESG yeah. or environmental education really opens up our eyes. And if, we, if it can open our eyes, we can then open the children's eyes. It can really give us the right direction of education, teaching, and for sustainable work. So with this, uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone uh, uh, for listening very patiently. Now I'll stop my uh, slide share, the share slides, and we can now go back. So thank you so much. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, I am not a very big expert on environmental education, but I'm a practitioner and I, I really love this subject. So maybe I will be able to share my experience. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, yeah. Mm, uh, thanks for the very informative uh, uh, insight into uh, the environment issues from a lot of actual uh, ground level experience that you have over the last so many years. Yeah. But see, however, like, I mean, uh, while I totally understand and agree with the importance of this topic and the necessity to introduce this from as early as we can, I have uh, one uh, doubt. It's not really a question on the content, but one, one doubt that I have on um, Let's say uh, this, all this, so, I mean, uh, aggressive rate of development, so-called development that we have been doing uh, mm -hmm. as a human race, okay? Let's assume that this has, uh, this is a problem that has really reached a huge proportion in the last 50 or let's say 100 <laughs> years. Yes. Okay. The, the, I mean, our... Now, but let's look at humanity as uh, human beings or homo sapiens as a race until 100 years ago, okay? So now, now that 
living organisms have a history of lakhs of years as you showed in the beginning mm -hmm. uh, i mean how did we become this way uh, okay so insensitive to nature if i think about it like what made us turn this way was it a genetic mutation or was it the greed driven by the social context around us in which we get born let me finish so what i feel is like i mean to say that human being as a race is is this ego which may be true Uh, so ego driven and all that is it a natural consequence of the whole evolution process we really couldn't have helped reaching this as a because evolution is very casual process right i don't yeah. think it happens as a calculated activity mm -hmm. so i mean to understand that i think is also a part of further understanding how we can change things or how we can change ourselves for the better i mean do we get used to the notion that we i mean uh, this is what confuses me actually as to Yeah, isn't yeah. Uh, very very good question, sir. No, so let me whatever yeah. I have, uh, I have understood. Uh, let me try to uh, explain. Actually, we were made in the beginning to cooperate because uh, uh, to kill a big animal uh, for the food. Uh, that's how education started. Actually, uh, we were in fact uh, when I when I read some 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 scriptures when I saw some movie. humans were eating humans actually without because we had a very very primitive brain brain and our brain was very very uh, simple you know, the first human so we started killing each other we killed each other and, uh, the weaker ones got killed and the older ones got killed and the diseased ones got got but they wanted to do something different they wanted to you know when the brain developed it took billions of millions of years then they when they started um, uh, killing the bigger animals they wanted a cooperation they wanted a team work so they thought that oh teamwork is very important but when it came to the economical when the economic activity started actually there's a competition competition of resources exploration you know like um, why did why did the why did the british come to india why did the british occupy a lot of a large part of america and europe and um, the, because it's exploration so this competition economic competition actually uh, devastated the environment otherwise uh, there is no reason why we should be competing like this because we are all happy yeah so yeah. it's the ec economic activities actually so correct yeah uh, so so even today also it's happening but now people are beginning to realize that the economic activities the competition has to now change into cooperation economic activity has to be there but not at the cost of environment and now we have done enough damage to the environment enough damage to the earth because everything is uh, i mean not <laughs> taken from the other plant we we are not building anything from the taking the resources from the other plant is from the earth only and we have we have now realized this but too late now it's too late people have realized but it's too late but still nevertheless uh, there is time so uh, I, i i don't know whether i i was able to answer your question but i feel that is the economic activity Yeah, yeah. I, I get your point. So yeah, greed. I mean, yeah. So yeah. Lord Buddha has said that it's the greed. Greed is the main cause of suffering. Right. And it is quite natural, actually. Even the instinctively also, even uh, even in, among the animals also, they have uh, some this this kind of thing is there. This no, no. Uh, yeah, I I understand. Like my point is like I mean, let's say look at our parents, our grandparents. I I think at every stage, most of human beings. Let's leave aside the saints and those who have evolved. outgrown their material needs let's leave them aside i mean it's difficult i mean they are beyond our comprehension because they are of a different uh, level mm -hmm. but most of us like i think even our parents or their parents to increase the material comfort of our home or context i think is pretty instinctively built into us yeah right mm -hmm. so now what constitutes that next level next step of growth that depends on the kind of setup that i get born into i mean mm -hmm. what was a uh, very luxury for my parents or not even thinkable for my grandparents for us or for us children it will look like the basic thing yeah yeah right so i mean i mean we innocently we get put into a system at mm. the time of our birth yeah. wherein uh, i may have naturally accepted some things as very basic which are ha causing harm to environment so it is more out of uh, i mean somewhere while sensitizing the children we should take care to make sure that we don't make them feel that we are inherently bad no no I mean, it's not right. that i mean there is enough yeah. you know mahatma gandhi has very rightly said because i want to quote mahatma gandhi because mahatma gandhi is taken as the global teacher 
by even by UNESCO, his quotes are because uh, in the Ahmedabad declaration in 2007 uh, conference, I was there in 2007. So the fourth uh, conference, fourth international conference. Uh, so uh, Mahatma Gandhi's life was very simple. And he has said that his true. life is education. My life is my education. That's what he has true, said. Very true, very true, so yeah. UNESCO has really uh, appreciated that and every every person that spoke in Ahmedabad uh, conference, they took the name of Mahatma Gandhi. And yeah. we were taken to the Gandhi ashram. And Mahatma Gandhi has rightly said that Mother Earth has enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Right. So it's enough. If we have enough, fine. Because you see, I'll just give you an example. What is the purpose of having 10 pairs of shoes at home when you yeah. are wearing just one pair? Ah, yes. Yeah. So if you, if you are buying one pair of shoes, a new pair, when you are already using it, use it until the it really gives the service. And True. if you make a new if you if you buy a new pair of shoes, that means indirectly you are killing an animal. Okay. That's that connection we have to show to the children. Yeah. So this is a deeper, I mean, a detailed kind of environmental education um, tra training. So uh, we may have a lot of clothes, you know. We have a lot of clothes, you know. It's all full of, you know, the, 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 the Almira is full of clothes, but we are wearing just one shirt. So wh wh what about having just few and limited number of clothes so that there's no pollution, there's no, so the demands, the consumerism has to really improve. True, this is absolutely, I mean, Unquestionable, very true. Yeah, totally. So agree we have to really, way. really work on this, these small areas because small actions can make a big difference. Yeah. So we have done enough of uh, footprint. Our footprints have become so high. Now we have to really reduce those footprints and increase our handprints. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <clears throat> So in the meantime, I would request all of you to leave the feedback. A uh, few of you have already. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, please, please leave the feedback. And uh, Pranita ma'am has saying that, see, even a small girl in uh, called Greta uh, Thunberg uh, has really, the, every Friday she has a climate strike, uh, you know, every Friday she does the climate strike program. Very small girl. Now she has become quite big, but she was small when she started. So everybody has to work really. Because everybody is responsible, because everybody is affected. You can't say that climate just doesn't affect me. Maybe, yes, it doesn't affect the developed countries because they are more into the, you know, the heating, lighting system and it's different. But our people in the Eastern area, Eastern, South, um, Eastern um, uh, in, the, in the world, we have a lot of agriculture and people working outside the field. They can't use the heater or cooler in the field. Climate change directly hits the agriculture system, so that's the thing. So you can use your technology and do something, but but you can't really block it. So thank you, Arjun, sir, for your compliments. <clears throat> um, so, Purnima, uh, uh, ma'am, anything uh, that you have? Uh, I feel I've uh, done my part um, and uh, we have already had some kind of thing, but we can still for five minutes, we can still, uh, keep uh, going of the discussion if we have anything. And uh, my sincere request is if you have, uh, are planning to do any projects, I can, uh, you can write to me in the, in, by, in the email and I can send you my, my experience, my notes and my project um, guides, something like that. <laughs> There are any more uh, questions or, or yeah. anything that you want to explain? Yeah, uh, there's no question, but there's a compliment uh, from Vijay sir also, uh, from Arjun sir, man, uh, from Pinky man. Uh, Namaste sir. Uh, so the, the EST is more of adapting it uh, in everyday life. Uh, uh, how, uh, the teaching is uh, teaching part is okay, but it actually should help us in adapt adapting in the everyday life itself, isn't it, sir? Yes, yes. We have to really uh, 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 you know, yeah. remain as an example because yeah. I'll just I'll just tell you one example. Uh, <clears throat> it's about 20, 25 years ago. 
I was visiting few schools uh, and it took me about 15 days. I had to visit about 15, 20 schools and, uh, to do some environmental uh, workshops. And there was a driver with me uh, who went with me driving, uh, taking me around the schools for 15 days. Then uh, in, a, in 10 days time, he then he attended, actually he knew some English. He attended all the workshops that I, all the talk program that I did. This was in uh, 2000 and, no, it's in 1996, I think, 96, 97, 96. So then in 10, after 10 days, he told me, sir, I, I learned one very good thing from you. Very good habit from you. Actually, whatever I used to eat, all the chocolates, whatever, you know, all the pan and everything, whatever I used to take, uh, I used to throw out of the car. You know, driving is to just eat chocolate. What I did was, uh, what I used to do was, I was to, whatever I ate, I used to put in my pocket, uh, you know, all the sweet wrappers. So I didn't know that he was noticing it for a, for five, 10 days. So then he told me, then I asked what? Then I, know, I, I wanted to throw it out, but somehow I, I'm not able to throw it out because I'm also, I've also started putting in the pocket. So it's a habit. So once you internalize, then it becomes, uh, then you have to really practice it. So once you practice it, then the children will follow you because if you, you know, the, the nature is that whatever a teacher says, the children don't follow. But whatever the teacher does, the children follow. Because we as a student, let's think, whatever our teachers did, we have followed a lot of things. We remember those teachers, but we have we have forgotten what they've taught. So we have to really practice ourselves at home. Now, for example, what I've done is I've got enough water, but what I've done is the water tap, I have just just below, I just uh, you know, knob, I have knob turned the knob in such a way that only the right amount of water comes down everywhere bathroom, kitchen, toilet, everywhere. Sometimes I get a complaint, oh, the, it's taking such a long time to fill the bucket or fill the thing. I said, no, leave it. Because you, you shouldn't have waste. If you just put it a big one, they waste it. So we can do a lot of things. And every morning I do puja and I collect water and I, the next morning that water I put into the flower. So like that we can reuse and small, small things can uh, there are a lot of things that we can do. We don't have to really do big, big things. Thank you, Bijay. So, Purima, ma'am, uh, would you like to wind it up? Uh, I've seen somebody here, Sakuntala Koirala, ma'am. Uh, can you just introduce yourself? You just, I just saw you. Shakuntala Koirala, ma'am, who is here? Good evening, sir and everyone. Good I'm from Sansari, Borasita municipality. Uh -huh. And uh, I had a feel of uh, the form. Oh, yes, uh, yes, but, yes, yes. Oh, now I, I remember you. Oh, I oh yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and I just uh, was the uh, Gmail and then. Oh, okay. joined here. Okay, Sorry okay. for that. Uh, no, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you so much. Now I, re I remember. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I hope you like. Uh, I, I, I don't know what is the meeting is about, and I'm just listening. It's, okay, it's a kind of uh, yeah. innovative teaching, new ways of teaching, new ways of uh, thinking about education and teaching. And yesterday we had the uh, session from Dr. Purnima from uh, Bangalore, from Mysore. Now she's in Mysore. And it was on uh, how brain works, you know, all the, uh, the functions of the brain. And today I talked about uh, the education for sustainable development. Tomorrow we'll be having project work method, how different uh, things can be done with activity and things like that. So you can join tomorrow also. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, sir, for, uh, for the wonderful session. Uh, so if there are, uh, uh, if you have any further questions or discussions, I think uh, Pashuram sir would be happy to answer it. Uh, 
to you know we can always uh, be connected uh, and we would love to be connected because all of us are working towards the same cause and uh, he has shared his uh, email id in the um, chat box so yeah. please feel to connect to us anytime and uh, thank you all see you tomorrow uh, tomorrow uh, pradeep sir will be talking about experiential learning and uh, the uh, we hope uh, all of you will enjoy uh, and all the three days actually uh, help you rewire your brains <laughs> So with that, I would like to conclude uh, and thank you all of you. Tomorrow, 5.30 p.m., same link. 5.30 India time, 5.45 Nepal time. 5.45 Nepal time. I always forget that. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. So, so thank you so much. Thank Bye. You.